greetings, everybody, and thank you for returning to the In the Beginning podcast. My name is Pastor George Ray, and I'm your host, and this is where we try to learn and develop our understanding and application of God's Word from the very beginning to the very end. I'm really glad you're here. Um, Over the next few weeks, I'm going to be doing some shorter podcast clips around a few topics, some sensitive issues, some questions that have come in over the last, you know, several weeks, several months. Um, from various people, uh, various listeners, people in my congregation, friends, people from across the country. It's actually pretty neat. Um, and I've got enough now to actually sit down and do some, uh, uh, do some, do some serious recording in regard to these topics. Uh, but I want to walk into these, you know, individually as much as I can. Uh, some, some of these clips will be a number of, a number of different questions. Uh, but for today, uh, we're going to be dealing with a very difficult topic. Uh, this came about in a conversation I was having with a few people several weeks ago. Uh, and the topic that we're going to deal with today, the question I should say, uh, is around the idea of what do we do when a believer becomes a deceiver. Now, that is, first thing I want to do is acknowledge the significance of that question, because that's not something you just take lightly. Uh, you take lightly. The idea of, of saying that someone was once a believer, and now not only are they not a believer, but they are actively teaching deception, or what we would consider anti-God or anti-gospel ideas. Uh, that is not a... Uh, uh, a small thing. Now, I understand where the question came from. Um, I understand what, what, what it's about and what it's around, but just giving an answer like, you know, crush them, you know, that's not, um, that's not enough. That's not, not a good way to do it. Um, this question demands a larger answer. It demands something a little bit more comprehensive. And so we're going to walk through these pieces um, and spend a little time talking about what this what this topic really deals with because there's a lot going on in this particular question. So we need to want to we want to make sure that we're dealing with this this idea um, uh, in a uh, in a God honoring way and not just a flippant way that ends up making us look like we're you know quick to judge. Um, so the idea here first is making the claim that someone has not only left Christianity but has become an advocate for the ungodly um, is something we should not just casually toss around. We shouldn't just lightly walk into that. Now. Mainly because just because someone does not believe or does not worship the same way that you do does not mean that they are not a true believer, does not mean that they do not have the the redemptive spirit of Christ in their heart. They just may, you know, like a different type of service that you do. Now, I got saved in the charismatic church, and over the years I've known people who have left the charismatic church for denominational churches. I've never had a problem with that. But I do know people who have had problems with that, and they think that because they're no longer in the church, the type of church that they got saved in, that now they're you know somehow not a believer. Or in order to be a true believer, you have to go to this type of church. You have to have this type of worship, um, and it's you know to pray certain ways, you know, see certain things in your life, you know, speak in tongues, you know, all this other 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 man made nonsense that we just needed to kind of toss out. Um, this does not necessarily mean that we can just declare. That they are not a real believer. That is that is just that is naive faith. That is that is arrogance. Saying that in order to tr- in order to believe Christ, you need to believe like I do. That is just silly. We should never allow ourselves to uh, uh, to fall into that kind of trap. So, uh, but that being said, that also does not mean that just because someone was a follower of Christ, that they do not have the means uh, to walk away. You know, or another way to say it would be just because they were following in the path of Christ does not mean that they will stay on that path. Um, when you look at uh, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 4 and 6, it reads like this. It says, For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted, and listen to the language here, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Th- these are believers, whether you like it or not. These are believers. Uh, and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away. If they fall away. To renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again uh, for themselves the Son of God and put him uh, to an open shame. This is pretty easy to understand. There's not a lot of ambiguity here. So clearly, we can choose to walk away from the redemption of Christ. We can receive the redemption of Christ and and then choose to walk away from it. Um, Now, that doesn't mean that everyone who backslides is now, you know, a a condemned, you know, uh, condemned ex-believer who has no chance but to go to hell. That's not what we're talking about. We don't necessarily know what it means to walk away completely because we know that, I know from from personal experience that there have been people who have walked away from God and who have have recommitted. And some people will say, well, they were never believers to begin with. I'm I'm unwilling to say that. I think that's naive. Um, 
uh, I don't think it's I don't think it's right to say that you know that a true believer will always be a true believer or someone who was uh, you know once saved always saved. I don't I don't believe that for a second. I think we have the opportunity to come to Christ, and I think we have the opportunity to leave. Um, now, where that line is, I'm not even going to pretend to know. Um, I, I personally, it's it's not something that I'm ever going to care about. My personal um, uh, view is that I am I'm going to lean on the idea that Christ is here for everybody. And if someone turns honestly, even if they were there once, walked away and came back, that Christ is going to be there for them. I, I have to believe that. Um, otherwise, I don't see it. It's just uh, it things just become too dark. Um, but in this particular conversation, this, this idea of someone who was once a believer and has not only turned their back, but has now become a deceiver, one who is actively promoting false faith. This is a, this is a tricky one. Um, so some people will try to say that those people were just, you know, um, they were just never true believers, and the fact that they fell away and became the kind of person that they were really says who they were all who who they always were. I'm unwilling to go there. I find it um, very not very unproductive to have that view about someone. I find it much more productive as a believer to explore what happened, what happened to this person's faith that made them walk away. Um, instead of just pretending that they never knew him. I'd rather try to get to the bottom of what happened to, rather than just put my fingers in my ears and pretend like nothing ever happened. I think that's just silly. Um, so there are three elements that I want to explore in this question that I think if we look at these um, realistically, if we if we come to terms with these, I think they answer the question all by themselves. Excuse me. And I'm going to do my best to answer these things as completely as I can, but also in a realistic time frame. I don't, I, you know, there's no reason for us to be here for, you know, hours. Um, so the idea is for these to be short and easy to listen to. So here we go. So the three things that we're looking at here today is that the, that the understanding that, yes, once they were a believer, and do we know what that means? You know, let, let's not assume, like, oh, they're going, they're going to church. They're a believer. Uh, yeah, there's, but God, I got news for you. There's a lot of unbelievers who go to church. Um, and that does not believe that they, that they, uh, that does not mean that they are believers. So do we know what it means to be a believer? Do we understand what it means to actually follow in the footsteps of Christ? Um, so the second part of this is that they have strayed from the faith. And what do we mean by that? Do we understand what it means to be a uh, what, when we say true faith, what, what, are, what are we actually saying? Because there are people who can live a, a, a Christian-based life who never actually commit to the teachings of Christ. They, they like the idea of righteousness. They like the idea of a Christ follower. They like, they like the idea of Christianity, but they never actually commit themselves to the path. And that's, it's, it's just a reality. Read Matthew 7, you'll understand. Um, he said, and the third piece is that they are now promoting a false faith. So, and, and we need to understand that, that this is, you can't just say that, you know, because they're not a believer anymore, that they're a deceiver. No, no, no. Sometimes people just fall away. But from believer to deceiver is someone who is actively promoting things that are just wrong um, and, and trying to disguise them as some sort of alternate version of Christianity or the, the real Christianity, you know. So you people only believe what that book tells you, but I've got the real truth here, which is just silly. It's just, it's just. It, it just it, it's idiotic um the, the idea that you know somehow uh, you know god god's word is incomplete and like you have the whole truth give me a break um so we need to we need to deal with all three of these pieces so the first things first what do we mean by they were once a believer um what does it mean to be a christian in short the idea here is really simple it's one who believes in and follows the teachings of christ right um there's a lot more to this than just saying i believe the devil believes, but he doesn't follow. You know, um, the, the, if you were to say, "Well, I believe that Jesus, uh, you know, lived, died, and rose again," that's great. The demons believe all of that. Um, there are plenty of historians who can who can uh, justify the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus. They don't necessarily believe in the resurrection of Jesus, but they know that he was a real person in history. Hasn't changed anything about their about their faith. They haven't committed to the to the lordship of Christ. So that all, this this head knowledge thing is not enough. Knowledge is good. Knowledge brings wisdom, but knowledge is not enough. Faith has to enter here at some point in time. And so um, one of the things that it can come down to is, is really this. If you, th you think about this idea, do you believe, and here's a good question that every believer I think should wrestle with, do you believe that Jesus is who and what the Bible tells us that he is? Do you believe in the fullness of God 
as outlined in Scripture, not the fullness of God according to you, not what you want to believe, not what you think is right, not what you think is, 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 is accurate, but do you honestly believe in what the Bible tells us of who and what Jesus is? Um, so let me give you a couple of ideas. Do you believe that he was born a virgin? Isaiah 7, 14. The Bible says he was born a virgin. Do you believe that he was the only begotten son of God? John three sixteen. Do you believe that he was born in Bethlehem? Micah 5, 2. Do I have to believe that? It's, th- that, that? That's not w- what I'm talking about. The Bible says it. If the Bible says it, is that enough for you to simply believe it? Um, now, now, do you believe that he came to give himself as an offering for the sins of mankind? The, the scripture refers to it as propitiation. Well, we get that from 1 John 2, 2. 1 John 4.10, Romans 3.25, Hebrews 2.17, where it says that Jesus was a substitutionary offering for our sin. Do you believe that? Because that's what the Bible says that Jesus Jesus was and, and, and who and what Jesus is. The Bible tells us that he will return for his church at the appointed time. We don't know when that time is, but we know he will return for his church at the appointed time. We get that from Revelation 22.12, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 17, Acts 1.11, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 and 52, other places throughout Scripture. Well, I don't like the idea of the second coming. I don't care if you don't like the idea of the second coming. This is what Scripture says about Jesus. Do you believe it? You know, how about this one? one the most important part, that he is our salvation. Romans 10, 9, that if you believe, uh, the, uh, um, uh, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you, do you believe that you need to confess the Lordship of Christ? Do you need to believe in your heart that he was risen from the grave? Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm fully there. Well, that's what the Bible says about Jesus. Do you believe what Scripture tells us about Jesus? Because the only place where we gain understanding about Christ is in the Word of God. That's it. That, that's our source. Scripture, and this is what it's going to come down to, is the central point of our faith. It is the, it is the, the only authority in, in, in Christianity. Without it, without Scripture... Christianity is now subject to the whims of human religious leaders or people who just think that they have some sort of new revelation from God. Without Scripture as our check and balance, Scripture can, uh, uh, Christianity gets really, really weird really, really fast. Uh, and it doesn't take long to look through the history of the church to see how people have taken Scripture, uh, uh, taken their Christianity, pushed Scripture aside, and pulled the pulled the, the Holy Spirit told me card, and now all of a sudden they have license to do whatever they want. It never turns out good. If you want to see the lasting effect of solid biblical faith, you follow the groups who have always stayed true to the teachings of Scripture. They've never gone astray. But because God gave us his word, okay, we believe Scripture is God-breathed because Scripture tells us it was. Okay, B- because we have God's word in our life, we now have a universal standard a universal standard by which all areas of life are judged. All areas of life. If you want to know what marriage is supposed to be like, it's in Scripture. If you want to understand sexuality, it's in Scripture. You want to understand sexual identity, it's in Scripture. If you want to understand how the church is supposed to be run, it's in Scripture. If you want to understand how society and how our involvement in government is supposed to work, it's all in Scripture. If you want to understand the gospel message, it's in Scripture. If you want to understand sin, forgiveness, righteousness, heaven, hell, it's all in Scripture. All of the elements of our faith, all of the elements of our life are found in the pages of Scripture, book, chapter, and verse. So when it comes to following Christ, John chapter 1 tells us that Jesus is the Word made manifest. He is the embodiment of Scripture. So when we say we follow Christ, what we're also saying, what we're implying is we follow the teachings of Scripture, period. So as we follow the teachings of Scripture, we follow Christ. When we refuse to follow the teachings of Scripture, we're not following Christ. We're following something else. We're usually following ourselves. To be a Christian is to believe in and follow Christ. And that means Scripture. That means, that means the Bible. That means understanding the Word of God. Without Scripture, you have no basis for your faith. You have no understanding of what righteousness is. You have no understanding what sin is. You have no understanding what forgiveness is. All you have are human understandings that will change with time. When you claim to believe Christ, but you refuse the authority of Scripture, then in simple terms, you're not following Christ. You're following yourself. You're, you've made Christ in your own image. The Bible tells us that God made us in his, in his image, in his likeness. But when you 
flip the tables and you decide scripture is no longer valid for you, and what you have done is you have made Christ in your image, and you are following a fake. You are following a cheap knockoff substitute, something that has no ability to save, no ability to forgive, no ability to grant you an uh, uh, entrance into, into eternal life. You are following something that is just your own imagination, and that is a sad, sad place to exist. Um, there's no other place to find the teachings of, of, of Christ other than the pages of Scripture. Uh, but you have people in the church today who really have a difficult time with that. They don't like it. They say, you know, I learn from the Spirit that is within me. Okay? Um, when you look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, here's something that we find. So when people say, well, I learn because the Spirit of God speaks to me. Yeah, okay, great. Um, how about this one? Brothers do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false, false prophets have gone out into the world. How do you test the Spirit? You test the Spirit very, very simply. You compare it to the Word of God, because in simple, tr in simple terms, the, 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 the true Spirit of God, the true Holy Spirit within you, will never bring you anything, any truth that is a departure from the Scriptures. It will never do that. It is always going to reinforce the Scriptures. It does not divert from the Word of God. It reinforces its authority every single time. So in short, to be a Christian is to believe and to submit to the authority of the Word of God. Our faith begins and it ends in the pages of Scripture. So that's the first, first part. Do you believe what the Word of God says about who and what Jesus is? Really simple. Well, now there's a, there's a second part to that too. Do you believe what the Bible says about you? Do, do you know what the Bible says about you? So let me give you a couple of ideas. Um, the Bible tells us that, that we, meaning humanity, have sinned and are separated from God by that sin. We live in a fallen world. We live in a world, this is not the world that God intended for us. This is not the life that God intended for us. Sin has created the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, that sin separates us from God, and that sin must be reconciled uh, so that we may come to God again. And we have no ability to produce that reconciliation on, on our own. We have no way to earn salvation, forgiveness of sin. We have no ability to bring ourselves back to God we are completely dependent on a Savior. That is really hard for people to get a hold of. Um, we are lost. Someone's got to come save us. We, we, have the, we, we are not capable of coming back to God on our own. We are not capable of atoning for the sins in our lives. We are not capable of bridging the gap and in, in essence, if you read John, John chapter 3, that rebirth of the Spirit that is being talked about there uh, between, John and Nicodem uh, between Jesus and Nicodemus, that rebirth of the Spirit that is required for us to be made right with God, we don't have the ability to rebirth the Spirit in ourselves. Someone's got to do that for us. And that means we need a Savior. People today have a really hard time with this because it demonstrates that we are not naturally good. I was talking to a guy in a restaurant once, and he was actually writing a book about uh, about uh, it was basically about heaven and hell and the uh, the uh, the personal goodness within people. And he was trying to explain it to me because he saw me read my Bible and I was doing some doing some some theology homework. And uh, he was asking me, you know, what what I do, and we went talking. He's like, oh, very interesting. And uh, um, he had talked about this, this book that he was writing and how he was talking about children and how children are naturally like supernatural beings and they're born with so much goodness in them and so much righteousness in them and how we just need to understand that they are the embodiment of God. And, and, and I, I kind of looked at him funny and he's like, well, what, what do you think? And I said, I, I think that's, that's an interesting premise, but it is completely against the teachings of Scripture. We, we are not born perfect and then we're subject to the to the whims of a fallen world and we're taught how to be evil uh, i think we're born evil i i think we're born broken i think we're born with with a depraved heart inside of us and the guy was like totally shocked he couldn't couldn't believe how can you say that that is that is that is not how humans are we're born with these amazing things and then we're born with so much goodness and then the world beats the goodness out of us and then we become evil i'm like yeah no i don't, I don't think that's how that works you put two Two kids in the same, you know, the same area. You put one toy between them. One of those kids is going to smash the other kid over the head and take that toy. That's not a sign of, you know, overwhelming goodness. Um, this is this is this is just the reality of we are broken. We are not good. Um, we ha we have evil within us. We have we we are the we're, we're not just subject to the evil in this world. We're the reason why evil is in this world. 
humanity is what opened the door for for evil to be in this world. It was our sin against God that broke the world that we are now part of. We got to come to terms with that, you know. Um, that's really hard for some people to accept that they are not capable of making themselves right with God, uh, and that that difficulty sometimes actually keeps people from coming to God altogether. Um, some people will just never be able to accept it. Uh, I, in my pride, stood away from it for a long time. I'm going to be just fine, blah, 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 uh, until I realized that I, I really am just as pathetic as the Bible tells me that I am. Um, so uh, in a nutshell, what we're saying is that a person is a believer, or th that a person who is a believer, uh, what we're fundamentally saying about that person is that they are a person who has admitted that they are a sinner. They are living a life that is condemned by God. They have confessed that sin to the Lord and have fallen on the mercy and the grace of Christ, the forgiveness of sin offered through his work on the cross. And they have committed themselves to the Lordship of Christ, which, which in the Lordship of Christ means that Jesus' word, the Bible, um, is, is the only thing that is going to guide us in terms of right and wrong. That is the Lordship of Christ. He is the single authority in our lives. There's no other authority that we that we that we lean to. We may have to follow the the laws of man, but there is a higher law that we're attached to, and it doesn't make any difference. If the if the governing authorities of our world says it says like this is now legal, but the word of God says that this is this is not good, guess what? We go with the word of God. This is not good. So that is the Lordship of Christ. They've committed themselves to the Lordship of Christ Christ and to learning and following the teachings of Scripture. That is what it means to be a Christian. We know that we are a sinner. We know that we need a Savior. Christ is that Savior. We submit ourselves to Him. Or we submit ourselves to His Lordship. We lean on the grace of God and the forgiveness of, Christ, forgiveness of Christ through His sacrifice on Calvary. And we follow the teachings of Scripture. That is what it means to be a Christian. Going to church, that's great. You should. You need to be part of a community of faith. But that is not what saves you. Your denomination can't save you. Your Christian parents can't save you. Having 10 Bibles at your house does not save you. I got, uh, you know, a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of diet books in my home. It doesn't make me thin, you know. Um, I can have a membership to a gym. It's not going to make me healthy. I've actually got to do it. I've actually got to go live the life that, that I'm claiming that I have. Uh, and that's what it means to be a Christian. So initially, when we talk about someone who was a believer, that's what we're saying. That that was a person, that was the life that they had. They had committed themselves to Christ, um, and, and they, had, they had committed themselves to, uh, they had they come to the point where they realized that they were, they were a sinner, that they needed Christ, they needed redemption of Christ. They have committed themselves to that process. That's the first step in that equation. And that's what makes this so difficult. This topic is so difficult because we are talking about someone who we would say was fully saved. And now we're saying that they have strayed from the faith. This is much harder. Uh, this is a much harder point to nail down within this conversation. Um, but the simplest way that I think I can express it is this: that they have rejected everything that we had just talked through. They they have pushed aside all of the core tenets of what it means to be a Christian and have faith in Christ. And somehow they have wandered away from these things. And in my experience. Um, I've been a Christian now for 30 years. I've watched a lot of people come to the church. And I've watched a lot of people walk away from the church. I've been pastoring now for 14 years. If you count being an assistant, it's, more, it's, it's closer to 18. Um, I've been teaching the Bible now for, uh, as a Christian, of about 30 years. For, I've been teaching the Bible for about 28 years, which, to be honest, I started way too soon. I did not know enough, um, but that's the way it worked, and so it's been the same thing. So I've seen a lot of people come. I've seen a lot of people go. I've seen a lot of people get very excited about being saved and then get just excited about running back to their old life. Uh, and it's it's heartbreaking every single time it happens. But in my experience, and through looking at the more prominent people uh, in the church who have very openly and proudly walked away, um, they all have basically several things in common. The most common thing um, that I can tell you is they began to listen to teachers with bad theology. They got, they got attracted to something. They saw something. They experienced something. They had a spiritual moment, and they attached themselves to a teacher that had bad core theology. And there's a number of ways you, that we can talk about this. We'll probably get to this uh, at another time. But fundamentally, they ended up attaching themselves to a teacher with bad theology. Low-level training, um, the thing that drives me the most, uh, drives me crazy the most, is when you get someone 
uh, you'll see this a lot on YouTube where you get someone who um, uh, they'll say something along the lines of, you know, uh, uh, my, I, I don't teach in my church, um, so, you know, I had, to, I had to get this out there, so I started a YouTube page, uh, a YouTube channel. Um, that, that, that's great. Um, now, my first question is, why is it that you're not allowed to teach in your church? What is it that your pastor sees in you um, that you are somehow rejecting or, or discounting? What is going on that, um, that you have essentially rebelled against the authority that God has placed in your life and decided that whatever truth you think you have is now so valuable that you has to get out to the world in an uncontrolled way? Because YouTube is a completely uncontrolled platform when it comes to these types of, these types of lies and deceptions. Um, it's sad, but this is, this is all too common. You know, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just it's just unfortunate. And these are usually people who focus in on silly things. You know, everything becomes overly spiritual. You know, you got someone who's casting a demon demon out of a rock or out of a rug, you know, and, and they, they claim some level of spiritual authority. And to the spiritually naive, that becomes some sort of draw. Like, oh, look, 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 you know, they're so spiritual. They can see demons in, in rocks, you know, that's uh, okay. Um, n no. And these are typically people who have never actually been discipled. They've never actually been taught. They haven't d devoted themselves to disciplined study. Um, they've just decided that whatever whatever spiritual thing comes into their mind, then that must be from God, right? I have the Spirit within me, so whatever the Spirit is saying in me, that must be fine. Uh, that's, a, that's a dangerous place to be. Um, and, but they end up being very attractive to... Uh, as carefully as I can say this, the spiritually naive or the spiritually uninitiated, people who are new in their faith, they don't know better than to be able to see through these people into what they actually are doing. Um, now, the uh, and what happens is they deceive, they start to influence these people. And it's always the same thing. They influence them away from the authority of Scripture. Somehow, the authority of God's Word becomes secondary to the spiritual authority that you think this person has. And then God's word starts taking a back seat. And this spiritualism, which is really all it, all it is, starts becoming the main authority. So the, the, the mantra that you end up find, you'll end up hearing a lot, and this is, this is just all over the place, is, is trust the voice within more than the word on the page. And they'll say things like, well, the Bible was manipulated. These are people who don't understand how the Bible was put together. They, they watched a very poorly made YouTube video, and now they think they're an expert. Uh, but the truth of the matter is they have no concept of what the, what the Bible is, how it was put together, or the amount of trust that you can have in its, in its construction and in what it says. Uh, they talk about the difference, you know, what are called variances. You know, oh, there's, there's so many different versions, different, the Bible's been, uh, you know, there's so many different parts and pieces of the Bible, and they don't, they don't agree. Um, uh, which is, which to a, to a degree is, is, uh, is true, but they never actually understand the reasons why they disagree. And they, they just look at the numbers. You know, there's so many tens of thousands of different places where the Bible disagrees, but they don't understand what those disagreements are. They're called variances. And there's actually, um, none of them actually ever change the, the theology within the text. It, that most of them are things like, you know, the sky is blue or blue is the sky. You know, they're, they're just, they're just, honest copying issues and if you actually understood translation you'd understand why they exist but these are people who don't go through the training to understand the claims that they're making so instead what happens is they formulate an idea and then they try to find any sort of tangential evidence to try to support that idea instead of actually learning you know going into and and trying to study the the, the subject and uh, understand and figure out whether or not they actually understand things as well as they think they understand it. And 90% of them just don't. Um, they just, they would rather be spiritual than true, which is, which is unfortunate. But it's, it's just uh, all too common in today's world. Uh, but whenever you, whenever you hear someone say, you know, I'm, I'm going to trust the voice in me more than the word on the page, you immediately know you're dealing with someone who you should not listen to, period, because they don't know what they're talking about. Um, and these are typically people who, um, who will say things like, you know, scripture is too harsh, or um, there's no such thing as sin, um, or God would never judge, uh, we all go to heaven. You know, there's, there's, there's so many things uh, that, that end up coming out of their mouths, and they end up with very stereotypical, 
what's called single verse theology. Um, and it's very self-centered theology. Uh, you know, like I have the voice of the spirit. I don't need the Bible. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Um, they, where they used to talk about, about the Bible as the word of God or scripture. Now all of a sudden it's that book you use, that book you use, or that book some people use, or that thing you call the Bible. And it's just, it's, it's unfortunate to see people fall that far. Uh, because it's it's always arrogance that, that brings them to that point. They're so much more so convinced, so much more convinced about their own spiritual superiority that they can't lean on anything other than their own views. And this is just just a sad thing. So let, let me explain to you what I mean by single verse theology. So this is one of the things that came up in the conversation uh, down uh, a while ago, uh, and this this talks about people's you know uh, unfortunately their heretical views. Uh, and this is what happens when people don't actually look into the Bible. They just find a verse that makes them feel good about, you know, that that particular belief that they have. So when you look at uh, John 14, 26, in a standard translation, uh, this is uh, the New King James, um, and, and it says this, says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, this is Jesus saying this, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. That sounds so good. If you just take that one verse, it can make you think, you know what, I don't, I don't need the Bible. Um, I can just trust, trust the Spirit. And it's, it's so interesting to me how, common, um, people pull the, how commonly people pull this verse out to try to justify their, their uh, view that they don't need the Bible. So they're using the Bible to justify this idea that they don't need the Bible, which is, which is pretty ironic, right? Uh, their their source of authority for why they don't need the Bible comes from the Bible, uh, which is really unfortunate. Uh, that should that alone should 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 tell you that you probably shouldn't be putting a lot of faith in whatever this person is saying. Uh, but now check this out. So what happens when you take a single verse like that and you try to build a doctrine around that? Um, now can you? Sure, yeah, you can build a doctrine around that. Um, but what I find more helpful is to do something like read the other verses that are around it to make sure that you actually have it in context. Context is important. Context keeps us from looking silly. So now check this out. So I'm going to read um, uh, this, the same passage, but I'm going to go up three verses to 1423. And I'm going to start there and read down through. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what this sounds like in a different translation because we read different translations for a reason, because they reveal different things, different different ways of expressing things, help us understand more of the concept behind it. So, so check this out. So 14, uh, uh, 23 through, through 26, right off the bat, Jesus answers, Jesus is being questioned. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Now, you notice it didn't say my words, it said my word. What is he talking about here? He's talking about scripture. And he's talking about what he's teaching him right now. He says, and my father will love him and we will come to him and make, uh, make our home with him. Listen to, this, listen to 24. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I've said to you. Now, I love to look at various translations so that I can see how um, different translations have taken uh, taken these because various translations are not only just different takes on the scripture. A lot of them come from different source material. So the source material that you're using, the um, uh, the manuscripts that you're using in order to, to bring about your translation has a lot to do with it. Um, and so one of the Bibles that I really like to go to is called the Complete Jewish Bible. And this basically is a messianic uh, Christian Bible. So they keep in the old Hebrew names and they provide things from a Jewish perspective and a more historical perspective. Uh, and I think they're, it's just a fantastic way of looking at this. But now let's just, just look at verse 26 in the complete Jewish Bible and, and see what this, what this says. See if this changes things a little bit for you. Um, it says, uh, but the counselor, the Ruach HaKodesh, which means the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything. That is, he will remind you of everything that I had said to you. Well, now, hang on a second. He will teach you everything. Basically saying, what I mean by that is, 
He will remind you of everything that I have, I have said to you. This is not a section of scripture that validates continued revelation, uh, the personal revelation. The Spirit of God is just going to speak to you new things, new truths about God. That is not what this is saying. What this passage is actually saying is, if you love me, you will hang on to my word. But I'm teaching you a lot of things. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, whom God will send, is going to remind you of the things I have already said. This is not not a refutation of the Word of God. This is a support of the Word of God. And this is letting you know that the Holy Spirit's intention is going to be to remind you of the things of God, the teachings that Jesus is bringing, the Word of God, because Jesus is the Word. Now, inev inevitably, when, you f when someone who has once walked with God rejects the, the Scriptures as the authority, they will become an, author an authority unto themselves. And this is, this is where the disparity comes in. Um, now, because you won't embrace their authority, that you won't embrace what the Spirit is telling them because they don't want to commit to the Word of God, they want you to commit to the Word of them, you become the one who is in bondage. You become the one with the issue, and they're the spiritual one. They're the one who's free. This is a bad place to be. Other things you're going to find with people who were once walking with the faith, the faith that walk away is they reject things like they, they reject the idea of sin. Sin, sin can't be true uh, because God is love. Uh, yeah, well, God is also the judge. And what is he going to what is he going to judge? Why are we told to repent so many times? What does repentance mean? It means to change our mind. To change our mind means to admit that what we were doing in the direction we were going in is ungodly and to turn and ask for forgiveness and then begin to walk in godliness. That is the fundamental uh, the fundamental tenets of repentance. We change who we are. We change the way we think, and we start doing things God uh, God's way, which means the way we were doing it was sinful, and the way we're doing it now is now godly because we have repented. We're told this over and over again. you know. And I'm sure you know people like Hitler would love the idea that there's no such thing as sin and we all go to heaven. I'm sure he would really love to be in heaven after the travest, you know, the tragedies that he has committed you know, over, the, over his, uh, his time while he was still on earth. I mean, it's just, it's just silly. You know, if there's no such thing as judgment in hell, and there's no such thing as sin, what did Jesus come to do? What, what was the point of the cross? What is the point of the word propitiation, substitutionary offering? What is it that separated us from God? What is the rebirth of the Spirit? What was that supposed to do? This is all about reclaiming what was lost, folks. This is not about you becoming powerful. So what you're looking for in the lives of someone who was once a believer— Remember, let's go back to the question that we're dealing with. What, what do we do when a believer becomes a deceiver? What you're looking for in that person is a denial of the elements of the faith that make Christianity Christianity. <laughs> you hear trucks driving by. Um, what You're not just looking for someone who has a different worship style than you do. You know, well, I can't believe they listen to that kind of music. Who cares? God isn't worried about, isn't worried about the music that you worship to. Um, that, that's not what I mean. It's the heart condition that matters. It's the understanding of what a Christian is and what a Christian is not. A Christian is someone who has leaned on the forgiveness of Christ. And a Christian is not someone who's just trying to become a better person. The difficulty with this is that Typically, when we're talking about this, we're talking about someone who used to be a friend, or maybe still is a friend. And when we look at them and we see their life, we want to see the person we knew. We, we want to see the person we, we, that we, we used to hang out with, the person we used to worship with. We want to see that in that individual. And it's really difficult sometimes to open our eyes, to allow God to open our eyes to the point where we can see what they have become, not who they were. But, but what they have become. And what they're doing, what we end up doing sometimes is, is we rationalize what's going on in their life. We, we, we play the, well, it's just them. Well, you, you know them. I, they're just crazy people. Um, but that is not what we're called to do as Christians. That's, that's not, as, as a representatives of the gospel on earth, that is not what we're supposed to do when someone is misrepresenting the faith. When someone is promoting an anti-gospel, you don't need to be forgiven. God has already forgiven you. That is an anti-gospel. That is contrary to the teachings of Scripture. That is nothing that we can ever support. If they are misrepresenting the truth of the gospel, the truth of Christ, it is our job as believers to call them to the carpet and expose the issue. 
if not for their benefit, because sometimes people just won't listen. Some people are just too arrogant to actually believe that they had a, they had a wrong view. We hope that they come to the end of themselves and come back to Christ. What a powerful testimony that can be. But not everyone's willing to do that. So we do this, if, if not for their benefit, benefit, but for the benefit of those who may get caught up in the same kind of false teachings that they did. You may not be able to save them, but may, maybe you can save the people who they're around. So you get involved with this. Galatians 6, chapter 1. Um, let's see, do I have it uh, here on the slides? No, I don't. So I'm just going to read it to you. It says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in many trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore such a person, um, uh, such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So if a, if a man is overtaken, if someone has been caught up in lies and false teaching, then you, being godly, you rescue them. You step in and you do the best you can to bring them back to truth. We don't, we don't do this because we're higher and mightier. We don't do this because we're better. We do this because in the right circumstances, we could be in the same place. Under the right circumstances, with the right manipulation, under the, at the right time, we could have ended up in the same place. And we can't, we can't do that. We need, to, we need to care about them enough with gentleness, considering ourselves, because we don't want to be tempted by this crap either. We step in and we do the best that we can. So what do we do when a believer becomes a deceiver? When someone who has once embraced the core tenets of the faith, who has now denied, the, not only denied the core tenets of the faith, but is teaching against the core tenets of the faith. What do we do? Five things. One, we pray for discernment and guidance. You don't just step into something like this lightly. I am now going to be the warrior of truth. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Pray for discernment and guidance because you may be wrong. Okay? You want God to be guiding you in this. You want God to be leading you in this. Now, secondly, walk carefully. Walk carefully and make sure you're not jumping to conclusions. You know, we're not to be quick to judge. We're, 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 we're even quick to anger. We're not supposed to be, be fast in our conclusions. We should be walking into these things carefully asking questions, making sure you fully understand where they are and what it is that they're believing. Three, make sure you understand the issues, why they are wrong, where they are wrong, and what the truth is. Don't just look at something and go, you're wrong. I don't believe that, so you're wrong. Don't, don't be naive enough to do that. Make sure that you understand what you believe, what the truth is, what scripture teaches, and then, uh, and then, um, uh, number f then you move into number four. Uh, you do the hard thing. You confront that person in love and try to bring them back to the truth. Now, if they're just doing something you don't like, that's, that, that, that may or may not be you know, your purview to get involved with that. If it's not something that's ungodly, you don't have proof that there's an ungodly thing going on, don't interject yourself into something you don't understand. It just makes you look like a fool. But if you know this is wrong, that, that what they're teaching is wrong, this is not according to Scripture, this is ungodly, this is anti-God, this is anti-gospel, you step in you stay, and you say something. If not for their benefit, for the benefit of those around them. Do the hard thing. Because silence is a form of agreement, okay? Um, and the fifth thing is uh, if they refuse to listen, if you've done the hard thing, you've confronted them in love, individually, don't go gossiping to people around, you know. Um, have, I'm thinking about confronting, you know, this person about this. Don't do that. Confront that person first. Do it one-on-one. -on -one. Follow Matthew 18. Um, if they refuse to listen, you follow Matthew 18. And you confront them even harder for the benefit of those who might be listening those who may be they, they may be influencing put the truth out in front of those who may not know where the truth is they may see this person as some sort of authority and they shouldn't so you put the truth out where it's supposed to be and hopefully that truth will lead those people who are being misled back to christ where they were so they don't fall into the same pit this other person has fallen into it's never an easy thing it's not supposed to be but just remember something: staying quiet in the faith, in the faith of, in the face of those who are misrepresenting God, is not kindness; it's compliance. Um, your silence, in your silence, you're agreeing or endorsing. People who know 
who are in the presence of things that are just wrong. When you stay silent, the people around who are wondering, who may be looking at you going, wow, is this person going to say anything? Wow, this is totally wrong. Uh, are they going to say anything about this? Are they going to Are they going to, uh, are they going to jump in? What's going to go on? When you stay silent because you just think it's kind, you end up inadvertently endorsing this fallacy to the people who are around you who don't know any better. And we should be doing something. We, we should be smarter than that. We are supposed to be representing God in faithfulness, in truth, according to his word, and protecting that word. Yeah. So there's a little, uh, little well, let's see, how long did I did this go on? So, uh, not terribly long. Um, so this is obviously a, a little bit bigger of a, que- of a question. I couldn't do this in 20 minutes even if I tried. But, uh, you know, when what do we do when a believer becomes a deceiver? There you go. There's some five steps uh, steps for you. I hope this was uh, interesting for you. If you liked it, uh, if you if you enjoyed the video uh, or the podcast, like and subscribe. Um, you know, uh, share this with friends. And uh, if you have a question that you'd like to to send off, you can send it to me at um, uh, well, follow the link, put it in the comments. I always read them, um, and then I'll I'll get back to you. If you're on Facebook, feel free to mes- message me. If you're on uh, YouTube, uh, go ahead and just just comment, and I'll I'll get to it. Uh, or you can send it off to my email at office at riveroflifechurch.org, and I'd be happy to uh, add your question to the, uh, to the list. Um, other than that, uh, Lord bless you. Have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next time.